Hello. I'd like to thank you for joining us at Mission Critical Water. We're here today with NGOs, academics, entrepreneurs, and industry representatives in almost every field, from energy to manufacturing, electronics, extraction, food and beverage, and my own industry, agriculture. It's a diverse group, but we have one thing in common, an acute awareness of the severe stresses on our world's limited water resources and a common commitment to finding solutions. My company, Syngenta, is a research-based company dedicated to advancing the frontiers of agricultural technology. We spend more than $1 billion each year on R&D to drive constant innovation in biotech and crop protection, all of it designed to grow more from less. That means a bigger yield and a better and more secure yield with a smaller environmental footprint that uses less land, less energy, and provides better farm labor conditions. Perhaps most crucial of all, as we're discussing this conference today, it means using less water, or as we say, it produces more crop per drop. Let me explain why I think this is so critical. For many, the idea that the world is running low on water seems counterintuitive. In photos taken from space, we're a blue planet covered by deep oceans, white clouds, and massive ice caps. But this image is misleading. Water, in the form we can use it in our daily lives, is scarce. Only about 3% of the Earth's water is fresh, and less than a third of that is economically accessible for human use in an environmentally responsible way. With the exception of desalination, which is hugely energy intensive, costly, and impractical for most areas of the world, these fresh water resources are all we've got and all we'll ever have. There's a lot of debate these days about whether we've reached peak oil. There can be no question, however, that our world has reached peak water. Today, some 80 countries are already suffering from water shortages, and the problem is not confined to the arid regions of the world. Nations like Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Indonesia, and Russia are all teeming with fresh water, but even they sometimes experience severe drought. Meanwhile, China and India, with one-third of the world's people, have between them less than 10% of the world's fresh water. Practically everything we do requires water. With the world population growing to 9 billion by 2050 and becoming wealthier and more economically productive, the demand for water will surge. Growing demand for a finite resource, something has got to give. Now, a few years ago, several hundred scientists collaborated on a peer-reviewed study of our world's water resources. In their report, which was titled, Water for Food, Water for Life, they asked the question, do we have enough water to sustain a growing population for the next 50 years? And their conclusion was a clear and definite no. Not unless we begin to act now to change the way we utilize this limited resource. This applies to all human activities that use water, including agriculture, and links water to another humanitarian challenge, food security. This is precisely why agriculture needs to be a key part of the solution. Food production uses by far the most water. Some 70% of all fresh water withdrawals, in fact, are for growing food and fiber. And the world's population isn't the only thing putting pressure on the demand side. Consider this. You only need to drink about two liters of water a day to survive. But you actually consume about 3,000 liters a day if you take into account that water goes into producing your food. As the world becomes wealthier and a growing middle class in India, China, and elsewhere demand a better diet that includes more protein from meat, that number is only going to increase. It takes about 40 liters of water to produce a slice of bread. It takes 1,000 liters of water to produce a glass of milk. And it takes 2,400 liters to produce a single hamburger. Now, this may not be an issue where water is in plentiful supply, but many of the key sources of water we use today are actually running dry. 
including many underground reservoirs that nourish life around the world. Consider this, both Mexico and China are using water at a rate of 25% faster than it can be renewed. While in India, the rate is 56% and may someday reach the point where saline intrusion or pollution leaves the aquifers completely beyond recovery. We shouldn't assume, though, that water shortages are a problem one sees only in the developing world and emerging economies. The United States is already feeling the impact of water scarcity. California is under perennial threat of running out of water, and the breadbasket of the U.S. Midwest is also threatened. That's because the Ogallala Aquifer, which supplies irrigation water to some of the top grain-producing states, is disappearing. In some areas, it has already declined 100 feet or more, and there is no real alternative. In other words, the problem is worldwide. In fact, it's estimated that within 15 years, depleted groundwater throughout the world could cause losses equal to the entire grain harvest in India and the United States combined. The good news, though, is that the problem has a solution. I know my industry well. We have the technologies. In partnership with the farmer, we know what has to be done. And there is no question in my mind that we can meet our growing demand with the water we now have. But this means it can't be business as usual. Not for our industry, not for farmers, not for governments, NGOs, and for that matter, not even for the general public. For too long, we've had an exploitative relationship with the environment that sustains us. And if we're going to meet this and other challenges, we have to learn to be better, more conscientious stewards of the one world we live on. To my mind, this means using technology to relieve pressure on land and water resources. We've done it in the past with the Green Revolution in the 60s and 70s that dramatically increased crop yields and saved billions from starvation. Today, we need a new blue-green revolution for water and food, which boosts both overall production and crop-for-drop -drop efficiency. If you want an example of technology at work, look at the major crop production in the U.S., a leading adopter of continuously improving agricultural technologies, including bio, biotechnology and modern chemical technologies. From 1987 to 2007, the U.S. saw a 29% increase in soybean productivity, while irrigation efficiency improved 20% per bushel. Corn productivity increased 41% during this time, and irrigation water efficiency increased 27%. Cotton productivity went up by 31%, and crop per drop water efficiency by nearly 50%. All saw dramatic improvements, as well as improvements in energy efficiency, reduction of soil loss, land use, and reduced climate impact. And as impressive as these numbers are, it is all the more impressive when one considers that the U.S. was already starting from a very high baseline in efficiency. Another example is Brazil, which has become a leader in the adoption of new solutions. Brazilian farmers increased soy production by 50 percent in just 10 years with the application of modern crop protection and biotechnology. In countries still lagging behind, the opportunity for improvement is even greater. It's estimated that Asia could boost agricultural productivity by 20% in a single decade simply by adopting currently available technology and modern farming methods. My company and others are also constantly innovating new solutions. With more than 5,000 people in research and development, one-fifth of our workforce is essentially devoted to developing new ways to grow more from less. Some examples. One new corn hybrid technology can protect the plant during drought, improving up to 15% of its yield potential. The use of plant growth regulators can increase yields by up to 25% while actually using 15% less water to do so. Crop enhancement products can enable plants to grow deeper and more robust root systems. This is an example of crop enhancement from Brazil 
where we found a unique vigor effect from seed treatments resulting in healthy germination, bigger and stronger plants, as you see here in this slide, and much stronger roots, which lead to better yields. Benefits that go beyond traditional crop protection. And we're looking into new technologies as well that reduce the plant's loss of moisture through its leaves. One of the most critical advances of the modern era is the widespread adoption of no-till agriculture. The plow is an ancient technology to control weeds. Modern herbicides, however, can make that plowing nearly unnecessary, thereby allowing the soil to remain intact, reduce erosion and runoff, and keep more moisture in the earth. Today, much of the corn in the United States and over 70% of crops in Argentina are grown using this no-till method. Modern irrigation methods can also help avoid wasting water. Rice, the staple crop of much of Asia, has huge potential in this area. We'll be examining this in greater detail during the third day of the conference, which is devoted to the particular water challenges confronting Asia. For now, let me just say in brief that the traditional method of flooding rice paddies to irrigate and control weeds is enormously wasteful. Modern herbicides can take care of the weeds, and a new simple solution to irrigation are also available. One, called Panipipe, can both cut irrigation water used and boost incomes by 30% each. These are just some of the solutions modern agricultural technology can bring to respond to the water crisis. But the fact is, no single industry can do this alone. We must work together, expand public-private partnerships, and include all stakeholders in this effort. Most of all, though, we have to recognize that technology on the farm cannot be a lifestyle choice. Providing access to technology and know-how and enabling individuals and communities to choose the best options for growing food and managing water is going to be critical if we want to avert ever more devastating shortages in the future. Unfortunately, though, finding more and more obstacles standing in the way these days. These include unrealistic regulations based on a misinterpretation of what's known as the precautionary principle, which goes to tip science on its head. Instead of driving for continuous improvement, as intended in its original definition, today any other concern, whether real or perceived, is considered a deal breaker. It's enough to squash a technology, no matter how critical it may be to our food and water security. Irrational fear, rather than science, thus becomes the regulatory standard. Take the case of biotech crops. We often hear the fear raised that these crops can't be properly managed in the environment. The European Union has banned biotech largely on this very basis. Biotech crops have now been planted safely and properly stewarded for 14 years and now cover some 134 million hectares of land in America, Canada, Brazil, and 23 other countries. The immediate casualty of this kind of fear-based policy isn't the developed world, which can import the extra food it needs. It's the developing world, particularly smallholder farmers struggling to rise above subsistence who are all too often left to follow in the other's lead. Ultimately, however, we have to ask ourselves what kind of precaution it is that denies our world the tools we need to overcome the water crisis and feed our growing population. Later in the conference, we'll be exploring how devastating this would be to our hopes for alleviating hunger and spurring sustainable development. My fear, to be candid, is the terrible consequences to the environment and human well-being if we don't use biotech to its full potential. Shortly before his death at 95, Norman Borlaug, the pioneer of the first Green Revolution, wrote, if our new varieties had been subjected to the kinds of regulatory strictures and requirements that are being inflicted upon the new biotechnology, they never would have become available. We have the science to meet the challenges ahead. The real issue before us, though, is whether we will have the courage to make the right choices. The many committed people participating in this conference give me great hope that we will. 
The wealth of knowledge and innovation they and their industries bring to this challenge gives me great encouragement. With imagination, science, and compassion, we can and we will learn to grow more from less. Thank you.